stop. <laughs> no, stop. Take a moment, think about your thoughts right now. What exactly are you thinking? What do you think I'm going to say? What influenced those thoughts? Is it your expectations of these talks, the school we're at, or my skin color or gender? This is a challenge that I pose to test my perceptions. And it's, it's really fun to test our perceptions when it's something like puzzles or, or illusions, right? Like, is that dress black and blue, or is it gold and yellow, white? I don't know, whatever it is, right? But we don't gain the same level of enjoyment when it is more of our political perceptions that are being challenged. Oftentimes, these can raise stress and emotions that can block our ability to learn and listen. And it's tough to be challenged in this way. But without challenge to our beliefs, how can we refine them and grow intellectually? So, here's a nice little poem. Ah, we are ships in the sea of beauty, and destination is our truth. But, passion be the wind in our sails, and reason be the rudder that guides us. Let passion overtake us, and truth will evade us. Hello everyone, my name is Michael Grohm, and I am here to discuss the dialectic life. But in order to do that, I want to first start by getting some terms out of the way. Right, so the first is truth. What is truth? Well, truth is essentially something that is, well, real. It exists in objective reality beyond our minds. But we as subjective creatures view the world through ideological lenses that are tinted and blurred by our beliefs and our experiences. Ah. And that actually leads us to our inability to actually see truth. Or when we're looking at it, we can't be sure what that is. And that's what leads us to belief. Belief, in its most basic sense, is uh, essentially a claim or thought that we hold to be true. And these can vary in our certainty, our evidence, in their complexity or their accuracy. Um, for example, uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a belief. The earth is round. Yale is a good school. <laughs> yeah. uh, 9 11 was an inside job, or that people find me really funny, right? A lot of these are our beliefs. Ah, but what really interests me, though, is, is not the beliefs itself, but actually the interaction between our beliefs and our behaviors. So in order to do that, what I want to do is I want to actually show you, uh, I brought in a nice wooden block that I made of the letter D for dialectic. Um, okay, laughs, I, okay. It's as if, do I have egg on my face? Got something? No, okay, fine, you know what? I don't know if someone's not believing me. Let, me. let me ask an opinion. Can I ask you, what, what letter do you see here? T? As in, like, Trump? I'm guessing you're a Trump voter, so obviously I can't trust your opinion. Let me ask someone else. You, you, can I ask you, uh, what letter do you see here? E? As in, like, elephant? Oh, okay, there you go. Well, you know what? I think, are you guys like trying to make fun of me or something? Like, okay, this is obviously the letter D, and if you think otherwise, you're either ignorant or stupid. Sorry, it's just my belief, right? Well, let me ask. What just happened? Right? Well, these are actually interactions that we kind of almost see a lot uh, with our beliefs. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn this a little bit over here. Got a lot going on. So what happens is we have a belief, and when they are challenged, providing even the slightest bit of doubt, uh, what we find is we experience a 
sort of psychological stress uh, as our minds resist this new information. Uh, and this psychological stress we call cognitive dissonance. Cognitive for mind and dissonance for disharmony. Uh, but what complicates this is that oftentimes we define ourselves by our beliefs. And entangling our beliefs with our personal identities, which means that when our beliefs are challenged, we often take them as personal attacks, eliciting an emotional response along with that cognitive dissonance. And the more involved we are with those beliefs, the greater that response of cognitive dissonance and disharmony. But what you might imagine is that the mind doesn't want to be in disharmony, right? It it often wants to take the easy and low-cost solution in order to suppress that stress. For example, shutting down communication, um, a misperceiving it, uh, outright rejecting it, or rationalizing it away. But as a bandage on a bullet wound, this method of suppression is superficial. And any future potential doubt or challenge to that belief can re-trigger that cognitive dissonance. And thus, many of us seek shelter amongst those whom with we agree, who can reassure us of our beliefs and our biases, and challenge anyone who poses a threat. Ooh. And when we label ourselves in this sense, we actually produce, we can produce eventual ideological factions that we label and conform to. And as our world becomes more globalized and we communicate through internet, what is the result? Well, it's cognitive stress each and every time we experience a new conflicting ideology or belief. And as our world becomes ever more interconnected and diverse, we increase our chances of encountering conflicting ideas and increase our cognitive dissonance as well. And thus, many of us seek shelter in our ideological bubbles. And unfortunately, a lot of our colleges have become microcosms of this world. Ooh. But it doesn't have to be this way. You see, for centuries and millennia, scientists and philosophers have actually used a method of discourse to seek criticism. With, with competing claims that are proposed, that are challenged, and are assessed and revised and accepted and refuted, they have actually done this in the sole purpose or the primary purpose of approaching truth to reform these beliefs and get a clearer picture of reality. And I would broadly call this method of discourse a dialectic. Now, a dialectic in its broadest sense is when two or more people are having a conversation holding opposing views. But with the shared intent to revise those beliefs and approach truth. And the success of this method is all around us, in our technology, in our law, and in our understanding. Yet, when we get to politics and public discourse, we debate. Instead of seeking criticism to approach truth like scientists, we seek to assert and prove our own like lobbyists. Often, no offense, often relying on, on uh, emotional appeals. And thus, instead of exchanging ideas, we exchange emotions, eliciting that cognitive dissonance, promoting passionate responses, and promoting more bias. Ah, now, when we look at this world and all of this debate and, and all of this infighting, it may seem like an issue that is too great for any one of us to tackle alone. But we can apply the successful strategies of science and philosophy to the social and 
political interactions of our everyday. In order to mitigate our fear of cognitive dissonance, reduce our conflict, improve our communication, and better our understanding of ourselves and the world around us. And we do this through what I like to call the dialectic life. As soon as we release our grip on our beliefs and allow them and our identities to change and evolve in light of new information, we actually open ourselves up to learning and alter our, the very relationship that we have with cognitive dissonance itself. You see, when we pursue learning, cognitive dissonance no longer becomes something to avoid, but it actually becomes something that we use and embrace as a positive mental signal that alerts us to potential conflicts in our thinking. It's kind of like an error message in our heads. And what's actually amazing about this is that by using cognitive dissonance as a beacon, I've actually found myself actively and constantly seeking out diverse and opposing viewpoints for the very goal of challenging and refining my beliefs. Because it's become the case that on almost unless I leave a conversation uh, by learning, with learning something new, I almost don't feel satisfied. But when I do learn something new, it's an amazing feeling, and I feel like I'm personally growing. While at the same time, I find myself utterly bored listening and talking with viewpoints that I already agree with, because it's as if there's little new information left to squeeze out of it. And the truth is, when we approach conversation with others, even those we severely disagree with, people actually pick up on our eagerness to learn, in our tone and our body language, and actually are often more receptive to learning themselves. I mean, who would you rather listen to? Someone who extends an ear in conversation or someone who points a figure, finger in accusation? you're wrong, right? Oh yeah, okay, well I guess I'm right. I guess I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> but why is this? Well, in reality, it's because to learn is to be humble. Accepting that there is something that we do not know and that there is more to potentially learn. And if we remember, cognitive dissonance, if, if we remember, it is the discrepancy between what we think we know and what someone else is saying that leads to that cognitive dissonance that shuts down our ability to learn. But when we seek to learn, we actually open up our minds to gaining in more information, and those barriers melt away. And what's absolutely amazing through this, through, through seeking to learn, is what we can discover is that so many of the controversies that we hear about today in the media and in, in our daily lives turn out to be the result of miscommunication, misinterpretation, and misunderstanding. I mean, so many times have I heard on the radio people talking about the viewpoints and beliefs of a specific group of people from an entirely different and inaccurate frame of reference than the people that they're actually discussing. Uh, yeah, so many thoughts come to head. We can think of uh, abortion, why people are for or against it, or even reasons why people voted for Donald Trump. All suffer from grave misframings of what people actually believe and value, and often rely heavily on preconceived narratives that could really be resolved with sincere dialectic conversation. Issues of, ooh, here's one, climate change, suffer from the issue of semantics, how we define and use words. So many times, and including myself, have I been in conversations in which we will talk right past each other because we failed to define climate change ourselves and we each use different versions. Doesn't really help in that way, does it? And with many of our contemporary black-white race relation issues in America today, like that of Ferguson, seem to display great and strong divides in how we 
individually and culturally interpret the same event in front of us. And when these issues are sensitive and perceptual, biases can arise, passions can grow, and creates a need for a dialectic like never before. But what this actually does is it, it makes me think that maybe uh, I have been using cognitive dissonance in that first example wrong in the first place. Maybe I should have embraced it instead of, instead of ran away from it. So what did, what did we see? Uh, you said you saw a T, right? You saw a T, and then you said you saw an E, I believe, and then I said I thought I saw a D. There it is. There's that D, right? What is this? It's, uh, it's T, E, and D. <laughs> oh, yeah, you see what I did there, right? Mm. Now, this object, I shouldn't put it down right here, is known as an ambigram. And an ambigram, in this case, is a construction that from each new perspective provides more information on what this actually is. Each side has its own meaning. And until we put all of these perspectives together, do we actually discover what it is we're really looking at? And this is important because each and every one of us in this room and people listening have our own unique vantage points in this world. And there is little more uncharted to a mind than what is in other minds. To all potential fountains of information to fuel our growth and our dialectic lives. And today, there is no greater resource, potentially throughout history, than what we have within our interconnected world to fuel those dialectic lives. Thank you.